Hello, welcome. My name is Shannon, and I'll be talking about maternal health. Last summer, I walked into a hospital room not knowing that what I would see that day would completely transform my life. I was a research assistant at the Pediatric Newborn Medicine Division at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And there, I studied the effects of preterm birth. I followed doctors who cared for the smallest and most precious patients in the neonatal ICU. One day, the doctor was paged down to a C-section, and I witnessed my first live birth. We welcomed a happy, healthy baby girl into the world with no birth complications. I left the OR with a huge smile on my face. But when I got back to the NICU floor, the air was still and quiet, and I could tell that something was wrong. The night before, a mother had given birth to two twins, both born extremely premature at 28 weeks, and one was very sick. I remember waiting outside the hospital room while the doctors huddled and murmured to themselves. And I watched as the doctors confronted the mom and confessed that there was nothing that they could do to save her son. And an hour later, he died. In the same hour, I had seen a child both enter and leave this world. And both mothers had the same expectations, a safe birth and a healthy child. But instead, one mom was left saying goodbye to her son she had met only a few hours ago. How could such joy and grief exist in the same moment? I began asking myself how maternal and child health were intertwined. Because we know that the relationship between a mother and her child is like that of no other. Just ask your mom. So the <laughs> Hi, mom. I know you're here. <laughs> Um, so this powerful connection means that the health of the mother reflects the health of her child. So rather than focusing on poor newborn health outcomes when it was already too late, I decided to trace back my steps and look at where it all began. Paternal health. Globally, 303,000 women die every year in childbirth. How many of these deaths do you think can be prevented? The answer, 98%. So why are there so many preventable maternal deaths occurring around the world? In order to answer that question, we need to ask ourselves a different question. Where are these deaths occurring? This graph from the World Health Organization demonstrates maternal mortality around the globe. And it's concentrated in low and middle income countries, especially Sub-Saharan Africa. This next graph from the World Bank demonstrates neonatal mortality around the globe. And it's no coincidence that the disparity is in the same exact areas. It turns out that where you live is the best indication of whether or not you and your child will survive birth. 99% of maternal deaths are occurring outside of our borders in low and middle income countries because of the lack of basic health services that you and I take for granted every day. So what exactly is causing maternal mortality? Medically, it's things like hemorrhage, sepsis, obstructed labor, and other direct causes. But I'm more interested in the true causes of maternal mortality, which lie deep in factors we call social determinants. These are things that you can't control, like your age, your race, your gender, where you live, how educated you are, and how much money you have. These factors hinder mothers long before they even become pregnant. If a pregnant mother in rural Cameroon lives 300 kilometers away from the nearest health clinic, she's unlikely to make it there for a safe and supervised birth. Because she lives in a rural area, there's little transportation to the clinic. And even if she were able to call a taxi, there's no money to pay for it. And even if she were able to call a taxi and had the money to pay for it, her inferior status as a woman in a patriarchal society means she, she may not have financial independence from her husband. So even if she had the taxi, the money, and the means to decide to go, she's likely uneducated, which means that she has no idea how important it is to seek antenatal care in the first place. Long before she enters the operating room, and long before she even becomes pregnant, the odds are stacked against her. 
So if you were a pregnant mother in the United States, this is where you'd be welcoming your children into the world. A highly sterile environment with a half dozen medical professionals ready to intervene should anything go wrong. And even if you do have to have a C-section, you have access to the latest surgical technologies to ensure a safe birth. The odds are in your favor. Despite your risk factors, you will likely deliver happy and healthy children. Now imagine you're a 16-year-old girl in Sierra Leone, the country with the highest maternal mortality and morbidity rates in the world. You live in a rural area of immense poverty. This is your OR. There is no doctor, no surgical tools, and you'd be lucky if you had a trained birth attendant by your side. You might develop an infection or have uncontrolled bleeding. And because you're 16 years old, your body is not physically ready to give birth yet, which means that you might be stuck in, in labor for days. This prolonged labor can lead to something called obstetric fistula, which causes internal tissues to rot away, leaving you incontinent for the rest of your life. Giving birth in a low-income environment can be catastrophic. But it turns out that you don't have to travel to Sierra Leone or other low- and middle-income countries to observe poor maternal health outcomes. In fact, mothers are dying in our own backyards. The United States has the highest maternal mortality rate of any developed country, and actually, it's on the rise. And these risks are divided among racial and ethnic lines. For the last 50 years, black women have been four times more likely to die from childbirth complications than white women. The interesting thing is that the biological risk is actually the same for all these women, but the disconnect lies in access to health care. This reflects the social determinants that mean that women of color are less likely to have access to quality, affordable health services, leading to this human rights failure. So how does this impact you? In the United States, 17% of pregnancies end in miscarriage, which means that two in 10 moms silently bear the burden of losing a child. And one in 10 infants are born prematurely. Many of you here in the audience are parents, and you've felt these worries flicker across your minds. And even if you're a college student like me, and kids are a very distant concern, you or someone you're close to will have to deal with the anxieties of bringing forth safe life. And the fact that it affects millions of individuals around the world, to me, is reason enough to care. So what do we do? I think this relates back to our TEDx Duke theme, writing histories and writing futures. We want sustainable change, and in order to do that, we need to attack the root causes of these negative health outcomes. First, we need to expand quality, affordable health care to individuals across the United States and across the globe. And if health clinics are too far, let's train community health workers to bring those health care services to mothers where they are. Let's use creative, inexpensive interventions, like on-the-go pregnancy kits, with vital vaccinations, medications, and surgical tools for labor support. Let's teach girls about reproductive health before they get their periods for the first time, not when they get the plus sign on the pregnancy stick. And above all, let's educate girls so we can destroy the social determinants that prevent them from achieving their goals and dreams and create profound change for generations to come. Because the truth is, maternal health is not just nine months. It's the entire life course. And in thinking more critically and creatively, we can transform the factors that lead to these health outcomes and give mothers and their children the best chances at life. Thank you. Thank you.